Hello, and welcome back to Bikes, Beers, and Burritos with Performance Bicycle. I am Jeffrey. With us today, we have Ryan Oaks and Jack Johnson, and we are here to cover various topics on cycling. To start, we're going to go ahead and cover the beer and the burritos. With us today, we have Track 7 Panic. We got a India Pale Ale IPA, and I enjoy it. It's got a nice hoppy flavor to it. Yeah. I'd give it a solid... Seven out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, track seven. I see what you did there. Semi-local too. It's uh, we're in. If you don't know, performance is in Chico, California, and this beer is brewed in Camden, Sacramento, which is a stone's throw from us, about an hour and a half away. So, thanks, track seven for. Well, we still have to buy the beer. It's not sponsored. Unsponsored, but, yeah. Yeah, unsponsored, but for making good beers for us to enjoy for this yeah. episode two. Episode, episode two. two. If you didn't get episode one. Hop on back yeah. and we'll put it in the description. You can click on it or you can just go to our profile and it'll be right there. But episode two is going to be a good one. So stick around for this. Yep. Mm -hmm. now I was impressed with this one. Quite smooth. It means 7%. So yeah, not too bad. I'll probably go 7.4 7 on this one. 7.4 7 out of 10. Ooh, pretty good. Okay. okay. All right. Does that mean I got to get my rating? See. I'm getting to the bottom of mine, so it's starting to get worse. We'll keep you a know, list of all these too. Yeah, yeah. Get yeah. Warm or winners. That'll go in the description. We'll just have a running list of yeah. like the, the ratings of the beers. And I think I think track seven, uh, the panic. I I have had it before. Uh, one of our teammates, uh, Eric Cockrell, if you're listening, I know he used to work at track seven and introduced me to to panic. And um, yeah, it's, I think it's a flagship kind of staple for them, and it's it's just like a solid, reliable IPA. Yeah. I think the seven range is right for sure. Yeah, it's nothing, nothing you're gonna write Homer about, but I think it's really consistent and good. Yeah, yeah. And then if we happen to finish these, we did also get some athletic brewing. What is it? The Run Wild IPA. Some non-alcoholic beers, just so we don't get a little too wild on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have our burritos for today. We went to Los Arcos in Chico, California. I went with the Baja burrito. And it's pretty close to what I was expecting. Got the carne asada, it's got guacamole, it's got sour cream, it's got the cilantro, got avocado. It's it's really, really just like a, a Baja burrito, yeah. yeah, yeah it's, beans, that's nice. it's really good. I give it a eight out of ten. We're not gonna let Jack rate burritos <laughs> because Jack is wrong. Jack is Whoa. from Southern California where burritos are supposed to be meat wrapped in a tortilla, and uh, Jeff and I are kind of mm. on the page of burritos should have more than just meat and tortilla to them. So, Gotta have the fillings. Yeah, I want I want those. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Rice, it makes the a beans. burrito a burrito. Yeah. Jack, how's your burrito? Still getting I got the California burrito. So of course, very <laughs> some from San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> I did have to ask for no beans as well. I've never heard of a California burrito having beans in it. Mm. It's kind of odd to me, so. But it's sour cream, guacamole in there. Obviously from French fries, carne asada. But I'm impressed with this one. I haven't had it before. Probably go 8.5 on this one. It's Ooh. a good burrito. Right. Not too greasy. A little bit of cheese in there too. It's tasty. Not too shabby. I just got a regular old chicken burrito and it's good. It's like a nice grilled chicken. Uh, Jeff would like it. Jeff loves his chicken burritos unless they <laughs> are kind of the... From SoCal <laughs> and boiled chicken. And then you get food poisoning the day before BWR and it doesn't yeah, go well. Yeah, don't eat that stewed chicken that's been hanging out for a no. few days. Yeah, you don't want that. Just got to be cautious with it. That's a grilled chicken. A-OK. -okay. Not a bad option. Well, sweet. We what go. do we got on the, uh, the agenda for topics other than beer and burritos? We got bikes so, to talk about. Got some bikes. And speaking of bikes, Specialized just launched the new SL8 this last yeah. couple weeks. And it's quite a redesign as far as visual looks. You know, mm -hmm. it's 16.6 seconds faster. So you're going to be all flying out there, flying, cutting through the wind. But what is all this speed from? Everyone's all already stated that it's the handlebar, right? It's not actually the bike that's much faster. But I did get the opportunity to go down to San Luis Obispo and test ride a couple. And I will tell you, it does ride, I guess better is a very vague term, but it is a more comfortable ride. Mm. And it is also a little bit stiffer, which is like- yeah, Kind of got an oxymoron yeah, there. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. But it's, it's strange, because whenever you go to stand up out of the saddle, the mm. front end feels super planted. Like okay. there's no flex whatsoever. 
And this is coming off of riding the SL7. Right, so fair um, comparison. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've put roughly 850 miles on one so far, and it's a great bike. The SL7. The SL7. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The SL8, though, is yeah. noticeably more compliant in that rear end, which mm-hmm. is strange. Like, whenever you hit... End there? Yeah, whenever mm-hmm. you hit bumps seated... I think it's that smaller seat post as well as like mm-hmm. the Athos bottom bracket and chain stays. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just has a little bit more flex in there that doesn't affect you whenever you actually stand up to put down the power. Interesting. I'm no engineer, but <laughs> uh, they did an extremely good job designing it, I would say. So we're thinking that you're getting more front end stiffness, so it feels more precise. You feel like when you stand up to put power into it, sprint, climb, whatever, the bike is flexing less on that front end, right? That's what we're getting at with exactly. front end stiffness. Mm-hmm. And we're thinking probably that's maybe that new speed sniffer oh, uh, yeah. first <laughs> head tube, right? The, I, I would assume it has something to do with it. Just the, the shape of it, a little bit more carbon up there. Right, yeah, more material. Uh, it's got to have more than just aerodynamic advantage sure. for it to be up there. So right. I'm assuming stiffness is semi-correlated with that. That makes sense. Yeah, and it's an impressive step because really you're looking for a faster bike that's more stiffer mm-hmm. and it's more comfortable. Like, Which I feel like that's every tarmac they've ever released has that same exact market yeah. behind it, right? It's like wider, stiffer, faster. The one bike to rule them More all. comfortable, yeah, yeah one bike is. to rule them all. And that is the marketing on this one too, you know? Yeah. But, but is it is it BS? I, I wouldn't, I mean, as far as like the 16.6 seconds faster, like that, that could be BS. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's all in that cockpit, throw that on the SL7, it could be the exact same thing. Right. But it's a better riding bike, I would say. There so it's go. not all complete BS. I, I am excited to get on one and spend more time on it. Well, so that cockpit, so everybody knows what we're talking about, the S-Works level of the Tarmac SL8 comes with this integrated bar Mm -hmm. stem, handlebar stem piece they're calling a cockpit. And the tiers below either come with what they've been using previously, which is that Roval Rapide handlebar, or some of the lower level stuff, just a basic alloy handlebar. Yes, and and that's like, the one that I demoed was the expert level, which came with a round handlebar. Okay. uh, Roval C38 wheels, Mm -hmm. so not the super steep, steep, uh, super deep, stiff wheels. Right, right. But a more compliant, a little bit heavier version. And the bike still felt different. So on your SL7, mm-hmm. you have the Roval this. Rapide handlebars and you have the Roval Rapide CL wheels. So you've got the nicer wheels, the mm-hmm. nicer bars, and you'd say the right experience, even with not as nice a handlebars and not as nice a wheels on an SL8 was superior. Slightly. Slightly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. It, it's so hard because it was like a couple days between riding. Yeah. I think to really feel the big difference, it would have to be like back to back testing. Sure. Sure. But it was, I, I was just pretty blown away by, by the feel of the bike as far as how it ate up the bumps. That's something to be said. Cause I, I, I'm with you. I'm just getting into close to the first thousand miles on my SL7 as well. And granted I'm coming off of kind of a, some obscure, recent road bikes, but just in my time riding SL7, I've been like, man, this thing is stiff and snappy, but it is a little harsh on that rear end. And I, I don't mm-hmm. think, you know, necessarily too harsh or inappropriately so, but it's definitely like descending and bumpy terrain. You're thinking about it a little bit more. So mm-hmm. if this uses a rear end that's a little more compliant without giving up on the stiffness, but you can add stiffness to the front end, like that sounds like a win, win, win. And then let's not talk, forget about the weight too. This bike right. is quite a bit lighter, that is huge. so it's going to climb better, it's going to accelerate a little bit better, and I mean, you can get the S-Works with their Ace in a 56 at like 14 and a half pounds. Whew. That's, that's pretty insane. Like, that's below the UCI limit. I think the thing that blew me away, talking weight, is something that's worth like telling everybody, is an SL7 in the S-Works version of the frame is heavier than a non-S-Works mm-hmm. version of an SL8. So you can buy their 10R, is it 10R carbon yeah, yeah, version so. of the frame, <clears throat> and it will weigh less than the, I think S-Works is 12R carbon, the 12R carbon mm-hmm. the S-Works S-L7. version of, yeah, yeah. of the SL7. That in itself is like pretty compelling. I mean, if, if you care yeah. about weight, if weight's a big deal for you, or, I mean, everybody likes a light bike. Who doesn't like a yeah. light bike? Yeah, I mean, if people are always calculating that like, dollar per gram value. Well, if you're going for that kind yeah. of a value, yeah. go with the 10R Carbon SL8. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, the S-Works version, and like we said, as far as speed goes, 
it really, from the stuff we've been reading about, it sounds like a lot of that, that 16.6 seconds over 40K is coming out of the cockpit. Mm -hmm. So you could spend some money on, yeah. if you know, if you've got gotten a fitting and you know what length stem you need, you know what handlebar width you run, potentially grabbing that bar stem of the cockpit, mm -hmm. building up a SL8 of the non S-Works version, and you've got something stupid light that gets all the aero benefit, all that 16.6 .6 seconds mm -hmm. worth of speed, with a really comfortable frame. I mean, you didn't ride the S-Works one and you said it felt amazing. So yeah, yeah. it's definitely a bike to look at for sure. We've got a few on site. Yeah. They're a little hard to get right now, but we've got yeah. a few. Happy hunting. Um, hopefully get some more deliveries in October and January on some bikes. And yeah, Jeff's actually got one on the way. He was so Dude. excited. He's got, got one of his own coming now. So hopefully here shortly, we'll be able to give you a review of yeah. A little bit more yeah. than just a, a day ride with on some, it. With some more time on it, with the cockpit and everything, get it all built up, and I'll let you guys know how it goes. Nice. But talking about that SL8, it was featured at World Championships. That it was. Nice. Now, it didn't necessarily soar to the podium or anything of such. No, it did not. As Evan Pohl did not have a great day. But it was there, as were many other <clears throat> brands of bikes. And Worlds was a very exciting day. Mm -hmm. It was. It felt like Worlds was in uh, Jack's family's homeland, right? We were close, up in yes. Close, <laughs> little north, right? Yeah. The road race was, um, it was in Scotland, so Worlds centered around Glasgow, city mm -hmm. in Scotland, but the road race was a point-to-point -point followed by a circuit in Glasgow, so it went from Edinburgh to Glasgow, mm -hmm. and then 14 laps, something like that? It was that. 10 yeah. laps of a 14.3 kilometer course. Dyslexia. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Which, how did you feel about having that circuit at the end of the race? I, I thought it was great. Yeah. I mean, it just changes the whole race dynamic as far as who could win that kind of a race. 100%. Yeah. Because it gets you a little bit of both there, too. The long open roads and then just in your notes here, 50 plus corners in each lap of the circuit. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty insane. Yeah. The Worlds is pretty notorious for finishing on a circuit. That's, that's a pretty mm -hmm. common thing in the road race. But some of the circuits have been... Blah, you know, like yeah. we're okay. They're just doing laps in a downtown area. It's all designed for spectators, right? It's designed yeah, right. for for the viewer. Um, but I think Glasgow, being kind of an old city, a lot of cobbled streets, a lot of narrow stuff. I don't know who was the course designer this year, but they put something wild together. Like to your point, like fifty turns per lap. Yeah. I mean, and the rain too. Oh, like the that rain. that completely changed. That's expected too. Yeah. yeah. Part of the country mm -hmm. there is too. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, d I thought it was hilarious at the end of the race, I saw an interview where Pojakar told the person who designed the course, he said, two laps too many. <laughs> like, two laps too many. It's like, okay, that's a lot coming from him. Yeah. And Worlds is, is typically one of the longest races of the year, longest one day yeah, races. Yeah, I'm always shocked at how long those races yeah, How many K was it this year? 271 K this year. 168 miles. Yeah. Which, I mean... That's a big day. Jumping ahead a tiny bit, Finishing time was just over six hours, right? Yeah. Unreal. I mean, that, if, if, that, if anyone ever questioned how fast like World Tour pros are, when was the last time you rode your bike that far? Then when was the last time you were able to do it in anything close to six hours? I mean, I think like a lot of Never. people go ride a Hillary Century ride and plan on it being a six hour day, mm -hmm. you know? You just toss an extra- Ride that far in less than 10 hours. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll be stoked on you. That's. Big, impressive day. So that in itself was always fun to watch. It's just how big these courses are, how good these guys are. But they did get a small break or decent sized break in the true. middle. Unintended. Mm -hmm. Non-intended break. Yeah, a little protest going on. Ended up being a 58 minute break. Almost an hour. Which is pretty wild. Yeah, how long then, do you know how long it was neutralized after that then? Because you would need some sort of like they, warm up period again to they didn't. Really? They, they oh, immediately let the break get yeah. their eight minutes that they, that oh, they had true. on the field. Right. And then the field went. Yep. And wow. the interesting thing there was whenever they restarted, the break got reeled back extremely quick, yeah. too. It's like everyone had time to recover. Right. Their momentum was all stopped. It's like. Yeah, if you've ever been in like a breakaway on the bike, stopping is the worst possible thing for the break. You right. you start to get into a groove, everybody settles in, the rotation starts to become fluid, you start to sing songs in your head, distract yourself from the pain, whatever you're doing in a breakaway, it all starts to just kind of work and you just roll that. Mm -hmm. To then stop for an hour, 
and, and then you, have and you to all come together that. again. You too. all come together. You get to see everybody with you, and to re- like they stand no chance. There's yeah. they stand no chance when the well, when it was early too. That was it early. is pretty early, and it was pretty early. Yeah, there, I think there was still like 190k to go. <laughs> yeah. Still, so much. But it was interesting to watch the writers how they handled the um, the protests in that break because you know people are off frustrated with the race organizers and like there's nothing we can do. There's literally right. people stuck in the middle of the road. We can't. We cannot proceed. We got to get them cleared. You know, they got law enforcement out there doing their thing, but some of them even took advantage of having this break. That's true. And one of them being the winner of the the race, like yep. Vanderpool, um, they went. A couple of the Netherlands riders actually went to a like house that was nearby and used their bathroom, <laughs> and he credited them at the end of the race for like his win. Wow. Like that was a big thing in his air interview. It was like. I'd like to thank the couple that let me into their house to use their toilet. Like, <laughs> wow, that's a that's a big thing. Vanderpool wants <laughs> the world's with protests from now on. That is crazy. They're gonna like frame that toilet seat on the wall now. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Have him sign it. That's there's some rainbow bands on it yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. Interestingly enough, um, I don't know if they were stuck using the the loo uh, over at that house, go. but once the race got restarted. Much of the Dutch team, including Vanderpool, were actually caught out in a split when the race restarted because the break went. They restarted the rest of the field. The field or there were two two breaks. I mean, there was a break and a mm-hmm. chase. I think. Yeah. So once everybody got restarted and the field took off, there was actually a split in the main field, and it seemed like. I think in those situations, you know, we want to think like the the race organizers have it all together, know what's going on and can communicate well. But there's probably just somebody at the front with a megaphone saying, all right, we're going to go now. Mm. And the whole Dutch, not the whole Dutch team, a portion of the Dutch team missed out, including Vanderpool. And they had to do a lot of work to get him back into the race, actually. So, but he got to use the, the yeah. restroom and apparently it was worth it. And he did play the rest of the race pretty smart, too. He did. Whenever he was mm-hmm. up in the moves, he let... Uh, Evan Pohl and Van Art attacked Pojakar, trying to tire him out when they were on the circuit. He just sat in and, and rested. Yep. He threw attacks when he needed to throw attacks, and yeah, in the end... monster attacks when he dude, went. Yeah, he absolutely. was not wasting any bullets there. Not, not at all. They were full commitment, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Which is different from how we've seen him race in the past, too. It's like, maybe a maturing Vanderpool, I guess. Yeah. You know, kind of coming into his own a bit. I just think back to like the Amstel Gold race whenever he won that the first time, and just towed everyone up to the group and then still just out sprinting. Yeah, yeah. But it's like he did all the work and still yeah, came out on top. Yeah. It's like a little bit different now. Definitely a little yeah, different. Yeah, and he, even with a crash, like 15K to yeah. go, which was, I guess, part of the drama of having 50-plus wet corners on a circuit. Mm-hmm. It's bound to happen to somebody. But yeah. then how quickly he got up was pretty impressive. And then anyway, he lost a cleat. Yeah, he broke the, the cleat. Oh, the, the, cleat, yeah. oh, the he, cleat and a bow and on his bow shoe. dial. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that yeah. that shot where the the camera zoomed in on his foot and he's sitting there and the foot just like shaking from all the adrenaline and everything. He's trying yeah. to rip that flopping boa dial dial off the shoe. Is I think that's going to go down in history. Is because he was clear solo at that point. Right. With but you, mm, you, not a long way to go. He had a like thirty second gap at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He lost twelve seconds from it. Wow. Which is wild. To yeah. complete stop, hit the deck, gather yourself, again, and lose your 12 out. seconds. Mm-hmm. If if nothing, I guess that shows you how much they were having to slow down for corners, though. It's like, true. The fact that yeah. he didn't lose that much is due to how slow they had to take those corners. Yeah. If it had been a straight piece of road or, or yeah, dry conditions, yeah, like yeah. yeah. probably would have brought him back much more quickly. But also, yeah. wow. that comes into, like, at Worlds, they don't get race radios. It's so true. the chasing um, group didn't even know no, he that he crashed. Yep, yep. Yeah, the dynamic of Worlds, one of the things I really enjoy about it is it feels more like amateur racing that we're used to. Mm -hmm. These teams have matching jerseys, but they're not on matching bikes. They don't have matching Mm -hmm. helmets because they're riding their trade team's equipment, but they're just Mm -hmm. wearing matching jerseys. They don't race together all season. They don't don't know each other that well. They don't speak the same language, which I'm sure is great. But then the follow vehicles, there's all these countries represented and they can't afford to have that many cars on the road. So a lot right. of the smaller countries, smaller teams will like, oh, let's let's go together on a, on a follow vehicle. There's no race radio back to the car. You're just, if you get a flat, Worlds is a really rough place to get a flat. Well, and so many people, like their race was ruined when they flatted. Yeah. Uh, what Laporte had a mechanical yep. and could yep. not get back in just because of how fast they were going on the circuit. Yeah. Like and even, how even if it had. was like a quick fix, you mm-hmm. just you're pretty out of luck at that point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean I remember one of the commentators um talking about 
when they first hit the circuit, how fast. I think it was the Danish team was, had hit the front at the beginning of the circuit, and they were going so quick. He, he specifically said, this pace reminds me of the pace a group would be doing in a downtown criterium racing mm. for an hour, hour and a half, but they've got three and a half hours to go. So the, how they treated that circuit was like mm-hmm. us going to a crit, except at the end of a huge day and for three and a half hours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nuts. Absolutely nuts. And that circuit featuring all those like short, punchy climbs mm-hmm. definitely played into all those like cycle cross racers that are used to just right. like all out, short, hard yep. efforts, small recovery. On again, off again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah Which is also why it, a reason that I think Evan Pool struggled a little bit. Mm-hmm. It was like when he was in that mm-hmm. front group, it was like he was off the front or he was off the back of it. Yeah. It was like not able to just sit in the group. So you'd say he liked those longer, smooth efforts then? Oh, 100%. Like a long time trial? Yeah, exactly. Like a long time <laughs> trial. I think it was interesting. I, I think I hadn't seen the race until um, a little bit later after it aired. And I know you pointed out to me, Jeff, you're like, the meat of the race is that last two hours. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching the last two hours. And sure enough, yeah, there's like the attacks are going. You see the Danes are on the front for Pedersen. Mm-hmm. Pedersen's on the front for himself. It, was, it seemed quite obvious to me that Pedersen had no interest in going to the line with the likes of Vanderpool and Van Aert. Mm-hmm. He wanted to make sure, he wanted to see if he could get a separation and be away from them to pedal mm-hmm. his own day. Um, which, given his skill set, was an interesting approach, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. I always consider him more of just like a sprinter. Yeah. But he, I guess, if you look at his wins, quite a few of them come from a reduced field sprint. Absolutely. Like, he has some of those field sprints, but a lot of times he'll do the work to be in a move to mm-hmm. sprint from that. And knowing maybe the depth of the Belgian team this year, I wonder, especially given the lack mm. of race radios, that there was just kind of this idea in his head of, I don't need to go to the line with a, um, wow. yeah. a Wout and have him have like Tige Benut there and Evan Pohl there and go down the list of all the Belgian riders that were there. Uh, like he, he He's going to be out outgunned in that situation Mm -hmm. so yeah reduced group Mm -hmm. it just felt really like forceful like he was really trying to force it it just wasn't quite and going at the end he didn't get on the podium i think because he spent everything he had to be there yeah exactly yeah it doesn't make sense for pedersen right yeah he just used too many matches yes he used everything he had it was great to see him there because i know we were talking before the race and thought like pedersen i don't know this might be too punchy Mm -hmm of a court and sure enough he makes it in that I mean at the end of the day it was a final group of four and he made it in that final group of four which was yeah star-studded cast love 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 seeing Pojakar in it oh yeah That's, I mean it's that that podium those three podium guys like yep. Vanderpool Van Art, Pojakar like it's your it's your Flanders break it's yep. yeah it's the same same crew yeah, yeah. super fun to see yeah but, real exciting racing going on absolutely mm-hmm. Well, I'll say Jack tried to give us a nice transition and I wasn't done talking about the road race yet because I hate time trials, but we had, uh, who took the win? Evan Pohl, of course. Evan Pohl. So, uh, kind of win. shocking. You know, I, I expected Ghana to win. Yeah. Yeah. Ghana seemed kind of like... Mm-hmm. This was a long time trial, though. It, it, I think it was the end <clears throat> whenever there were a few like little climbs and stuff mm-hmm. is the re- where Evan Pohl got that little edge over Ghana. Because the first split, little. the first, yeah, <laughs> emphasis on little there. But like the first split, Ghana had like, I think like 12 seconds on him or something. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, Ghana's no slouch going uphill, but he's just not going to do well in the steep stuff at the end of the day. I mean, we yeah. saw, yeah. we saw Ghana at San Remo this year mm-hmm. and make it over the, the mm-hmm. uh, Poggio, right? Like mm-hmm. with the leaders, like he can climb when it's a flatter climb and it's steady. Mm-hmm. Um, Evan Pohl is just a smaller guy. Ghana's really big. I don't actually know their stats, to be honest, but I know they're, Look, they're, they're on opposites of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. But then talk about, like, finishing on a cobbled I, climb at, like, that. 14%. Like, I don't think bites. anyone would have predicted that, that it finishes on a cobbled climb. No. 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 That no. was fun to watch. I think that's that was... one of the things I love the most about UCI time trials is... If going back to amateur racing, the stuff that we do in America, we have a time trial. We find some, we find the flattest, straightest piece of road we can to let people do out and backs on. That's American time trialing. Mm-hmm. And you watch this kind of time trial, and most of the good American time trials that I know wouldn't make it through these courses. 
they're too technical, they have too much climbing. People be debating, should I be using a road bike and a road helmet? And it's like, world tour time trialing is a completely different thing than what we do in the States. Mm -hmm. And to that point, you're like, how are they riding these cobbled bikes or these uh, these time trial bikes on these cobbled climbs? It's like, it's still faster. It still made sense to do. You know, yeah, it's yeah. just a a wild thing because we would we'd never go to a TT that had that in it here. I don't go to TTs. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're flat. I mean, we, I would yeah. be way more interested in TT if TTs were like what we see. It on would TT. make it more interesting. Way more interesting. Yeah, it's a lot more, a little more engaging. I feel like generally speaking, like amateur time trials that we know are tend to be big diesels with less handling skills just raw power raw point. power yeah. and just like tuck arrow they've got money mm. for a fancy kit and they're just monsters but they they usually are the guys in the back of the crit getting dropped right mm -hmm. the time trials in the world tour are some of the best bike handlers in the world because they got to rail those turns on really funky bikes going 30 plus miles an hour most of the time in the extensions though, most of like, the time in the extensions yeah, yeah it's pretty incredible and yeah. I mean, talking about a good ride, uh, Brandon McNulty, he took mm -hmm. fourth. Like, that, he beat that. Wout Van Ark, Props which is Brandon. pretty crazy. Yep. Yeah. So I think one of the first times I remember him. getting to ride with McNulty, uh, he came up for the Chico stage race one year, and he was just off the podium. And I think Evan Huffman had made it into the breakaway in the crit, and McNulty, for the last half of the P12 race, sat the mm -hmm. front of that race and towed the entire field around it. He didn't take a turn with anybody else. He didn't trade pulls. He didn't rotate. He literally towed the field around for 45 minutes, keeping the gap to Huffman in check. And it's like the dude, that was when he was like 17. <laughs> yeah, still on junior gears. Still on junior gears. He oh won that God. time trial, like a 30 and a half mile an hour average or 31 mile an hour average on USA cycling at the time's requirement of junior gears. So he had to have had a cadence of like 110, 115, yeah, yeah. 120, yeah. something stupid. Yeah. But seeing him now at the, at this level, like what an awesome result! Mm -hmm. That's that's something for America to be proud of, right there. Yeah, that's big time. That is definitely big time. Yeah, and talking about being proud of Americans. Oh yeah, Chloe Digert's comeback. How about that? Love it. Yeah, big fan. Yeah, big after fan. after her big crash in 2020, where she pretty much like severed her quad, like right above her kneecap. Oh, she yeah. had so much rehab, so many surgeries. I have nightmares follow up about surgeries. that crash. Yes. Yeah, I didn't. Good I didn't know you. Like she ran into a guardrail, flipped over it, and used the backside of the guardrail to slice herself open. Like I didn't even know that was possible yeah. until she did it. Mm -hmm. Like holy smokes! But she came back and won worlds yeah. again. In three years. Yeah, and, and it not, wasn't. It wasn't like she ran away with it either. She was putting in work. I mm -hmm. mean, she only had what a six second. Yeah, six second gap. Did you know she was sick for it? Sick. She for was the, sick. Yeah. She. That's why she didn't end up doing the road race too. Oh, wow. Is she was starting to come down with it. She had said in an interview, if she was going to race the day before, she wouldn't have raced. Wow. Because she was still sick. Wow. wow. So that's why I saw an uh, analysis of her power, and she had a really bad, like, positive split because her power dropped, like, 50 watts on the second half of the race. Whoa. Because of how she, sick she was. I don't know about you guys, but racing sick is really tough. Oh, yeah. Especially for... Uh, an event like Worlds where you're mm -hmm. giving everything you possibly can. Shoot. We, I mean, we podcasted like last week with Nick. Nick sat right right where I'm sitting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he didn't even come over for the podcast day because he was sick. And here's Chloe winning Worlds. Like, <laughs> we're going to give Nick some draft on that. <laughs> 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 I got to do seven your game. Up here. <laughs> no, no, we, we, don't, we didn't want to uh, worry about uh, Nick being sick. Some of us want to get sick. Uh, yeah. maybe, maybe that's a decent segue, too, into you know, skipping ahead a little bit, but we could... We could talk about Tahiti yeah. a bit. Yeah. So mm -hmm. as we have mentioned previously, we are headed to Tahiti mid-September. Yep. We're going to head out on the 16th and we have a six day, eight stage stage race coming up, which is a pretty big deal. It's a UCI international race. So there's going to be competitors from France, from New Caledonia, from all over the place. And it's a really good opportunity to test our skills against other competition besides U.S. athletes. Needless to say, Jeff's training his tail off. I'm training my tail mm -hmm. off. And thanks for not coming in, Nick. We didn't want to get sick. <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep healthy. Yeah, so I get, I've given him some crap there, mostly joking, but mm -hmm. we appreciate that. Yeah, we're, we're pumped to go. Uh, Jack's going to come with us. Mm -hmm. Jack's going to play a bit of a uh, soigneur and director sportif for us, driving the car behind the field. Yeah, so we're. You're heading down there with EJ and Mitchell from. Yeah. Uh, it's EJ's training camp. 
Check them out on YouTube. Yeah. We'll link to them. Yep. And we'll have two really cool guys that we're excited to get to know a little better. And we'll yeah. have a lot of fun down there. Yeah, they came up last week and we did a big old ride on Tuesday. Did some endurance miles. Got in a couple lead out practices. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. uh, that always takes practice. I yep. mean, it's so yeah. hard to get the timing right. Yeah. The order, everything. So it was good to hang out with those guys, get some riding in. And we're going to get, I think, quite a bit more before we actually head out. So yeah. looking forward to it all. Hopefully we'll have some content and you know check out EJ's channel. That's going to be the place to watch it. He's blogging his whole training leading up to Tahiti. Um, we're featured in a few of them, but we'll be mm-hmm. heading to Santa Rosa in one week from about one week from the time of filming this and recording this podcast. On August 22nd, we'll be down there. Yeah, well, that's the better way to say it. We're going to be going <laughs> to Santa Rosa to do the Tuesday night crits, the TNT. Yep, the Tuesday night twilight. Tuesday night twilight yes. on uh, August 22nd. Hang out with EJ and Mitch and uh, yeah, check out EJ's channel on YouTube to find out a little more about that and follow along uh, when we start Tahiti here in uh, about one month. And while we're on the topic of performance events, we are going to be heading down to the Mammoth Grand Fondo September 9th as well. Uh, we're going to have a booth there at the registration on Friday. Yes, it's and... Friday, 12 to 5 o'clock. And then at 5.30, we're in a group ride from there, actually, right at Footloose Sports, right at Mammoth Flakes. Um, giving away a $100 gift card as well, so anyone who enters to win that. But we're excited for that. Have a pretty good booth set up. Our first event of the year where we're after setting up a booth yeah mm-hmm. i think it's going to be a good time yeah yeah please please come by and say hi let us know if you watch the podcast or listen to the podcast yeah we'd love to hear from you we got we'll be uh, selling performance brand and water bottles for a dollar and we will be one dollar evangelizing our love for road tubeless yes. so if you don't believe tubeless is any good just stay home come, yeah, or or come <laughs> and let us change your mind we're going to actually yeah. have a station where you just got people stabbing tubeless tires you can if you've ever wanted to take out your anger on a bike tire and didn't want to, you know, waste a sixty or eighty dollar tubeless tire, we'll let you do it to ours. Come on by. Yep. So we'll see you then, Mammoth Grand Fondo, September 9th. And then we're gonna head back up to a little bit of race breakdowns, and we're gonna stick in the U.S. with this one because the Leadville 100 mountain bike race just happened this past weekend. How could we not? And talk about Leadville? there was some pretty astonishing performance, I'd say. Yeah, astonishing to say the least. Uh, if you don't know, Leadville is, I don't know how many years Leadville's been running, but in the past couple years, quite yeah, quite a few. It's um, like 50 or something. It's yeah, it, it's come under the umbrella of the Lifetime Grand Prix, which is a US based off road race, endurance racing series. So you have gravel races, cross country races. Mm-hmm. Um, marathon may not be fair, kind of marathon or, or ultra cross country mm-hmm. racing, um, anything dirt. So each event's totally different than the last. They're all established events. It includes the likes of, you know, Unbound, you got Leadville in there. Um, sea Otter. Sea Otters, Fuego XL was mm-hmm. one of the races. There's eight in the series, seven in the series? There's seven in the series. Seven. Yep. Mm-hmm. So Leadville is one of the, Leadville is one I think maybe, I mean, if it were me, more intimidating ones because it's really high in the air. The elevation has to be absolutely brutal. Yeah. A minimum of 10,000 feet. Yeah. The town of Leadville is at an over 10,000 feet. That's where you And it it peaks at like (laughs) 12.5. So if you were from Columbia or something, you'd be like, yeah, no big deal for the rest of us who live in, Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in Chico. We're at 200 feet, yeah. feet right now. We're at 274 feet. 274 <laughs> yeah. feet. Yeah, I guess I know that's pretty low, but mm-hmm. 12,000 is a different game. And starting at 10 is like, whew. Yeah. You're actually not going to sleep well up there at no. 10,000 feet right now up there. No, and even like, even if you are acclimated, you're still not going to be able to perform at the level that no. you're used to. At, and never, you never can at altitude. It's you're, mm-hmm. you're physiologically capped in what you're capable of doing. Which makes what happened even more spectacular in my book. Um, if you didn't know, Keegan Swenson has been absolutely crushing the Lifetime Grand Prix. He's won multiple He races. has already won prior to Leadville. He had won three of the three races. Yeah. Yep. So he's, he's got a really good track record right Dominating. now. Oh, yeah. And he went ahead and went out uh, to Leadville and won. 
Mm-hmm. He won last year, so he you know kept his his win from last year. I think he, he missed the course record last year by about ninety seconds. I think it was. Yeah, just over a minute. So on pace most of the day, probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah coming in just record. shy of it. And this year, what did he do? He absolutely destroyed it. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, not even close. Yeah, By, superhuman what effort. was it, like 14 Three, minutes or something? 14 like or 15 minutes on yeah. the record, and then yeah. second place was 25 minutes behind him on the day. Which is absurd, because this is dang near a world-class field. Yeah. Like, this Lifetime Series is drawing out serious competition, and to beat them was, in a six-hour race by 25 minutes, minutes yeah. is insane. Well, you say it's a world-class field. I mean, we have the likes of... Retired world tour riders yeah. competing. We have the likes of, I guess, technically current world tour riders competing. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have mm-hmm. people like um, Alex Howes and Lachlan Morton. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, so on the road scene, guys that have competed in the Tour de France and the Giro Multiple, and Spring yeah. Classics, they're in it. But you get this awesome other side of the spectrum where you have these incredibly good pro cyclocross racers, pro cross country mountain bike mm-hmm. racers, which the mountain biking side is the way Keegan lanes, right? Like he's, yeah, that's where they originated in mm-hmm. history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's really fun to see, like, have you ever wondered what a guy who races the tour de France can do against your, that guy, you know, who's really fast on a mountain bike. Cause this is, this is the, mm-hmm. I mean, you also see that in the world tour though, right. Of like, you have your one day racers and yes. you have your grand tour racers. That's true. Yeah. It is a different kind of a rider. Whereas a race like this would lean more towards those one day riders. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And these are really hard one days as well. Not to discredit mm-hmm. anything we've talked about previously. Worlds looked insane. Yeah. They did that however many K in six hours. This is also six hours, but this was six hours, generally speaking, on a mountain bike, mostly in the dirt, at altitude for the duration is like Yeah. I mean that not much drafting going on there. No. Early, early on a little well, bit. Well, early on, we did have, I mean, See, th- that, that's where it gets interesting because going into this race, Keegan wasn't even trying to win. He was just trying to break the record. Like, he just happened to win. <laughs> <laughs> to break the record like, required yeah, winning. Yeah, 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 I mean, exactly. <laughs> but, like, he was going with the mindset of, like, I am taking the record. I don't care who's in my way. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And with that, he had an interesting strategy. He did. That approach was neato. Um, somebody we've raced with in our district, another... What are, you gonna, are we going to call Santa Cruz Northern California? Yeah, Central California? Okay. We'll, we'll call it Northern California. Santa Cruz, call it Central if you want. Uh, Tobin Ortenblad, um, we've we've raced with him in a good chunk. He kind of cut his chops in cyclocross as a junior and got into road and has now seemed to uh, yeah. progress more into that gravel and off-road endurance racing. Mm-hmm. He's in the Lifetime Series as well. He and Keegan are teammates. Mm-hmm. So they're both on that uh, Santa Cruz. The the hit squad. The hit squad, yeah. And they gave him the one-two punch, that's for sure. They they were the hit squad for sure. Uh, w- w- I mean, Keegan described it, and other people described it, it was like a 25-mile... 20, 25-mile time trial. Time he trial. Just, yeah, he went just, to the front, hammered as hard as he could. Tobin effectively <clears throat> completely sacrificed his race in his day to get Keegan as far forward and help him cover as much ground as possible for Leadville to get close to taking that course record. And dear goodness, that seems to be something that was impactful. Yeah, yeah, guaranteed. I think it was because the year prior, I had I remember hearing something that it, there were times when it just lulled. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. everyone wants to conserve if you're trying to fight for the win, right? Right. right. So right. no one that wants makes to it sacrifice really hard to themselves. Rate, rate course records. So mm-hmm. if he's going for the win and he has someone that's willing to lay on the sword and put themselves out there, yep. I mean, that's going to help out a ton in the long run. And if the rest of the field didn't know their game plan, you at least got clues on the start line. They were yeah. roll, roll, warming up on rollers. <laughs> when was the last time you went to a 100-mile mountain bike race and watched people warm up on rollers? At the line. On the line. <laughs> on the line. On the start line. Wearing, minutes, like, down jackets. and dark out. The race Min- out. Yeah. Like, they were taking it so incredibly mm. serious. And that's what it takes. And, I mean, proof's in the pudding, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> 543. I, it's yeah, mind boggling. And I think it's also interesting how Tobin continued his race. Like he yeah. he blew himself up for 25 miles and then had 75 miles to go. <laughs> <laughs> like, Absolutely. At brutal. elevation. He finished in superhero. Yeah, he's it? six hours and 48 minutes. Yeah, still. he still did a good Super ride. Super competitive awesome. time. Like, yeah. That's yeah. impressive. Extremely impressive. Yeah, no doubt. 
Well, I think the other interesting thing aside from the event itself was we saw some some unique stuff, some some one of the best parts I guess about the Lifetime Grand Prix is all the events are different. Mm-hmm. And that means gear selection is so unique to the rider. The riders often favor what they think the course needs. They favor what they think their skill set is. So we see interesting mixes of like, is this gravel? Is this cross-country mountain bike race? Do I run hardtail? Do I run full suspension? What tires? A lot of options. And um, there were some really interesting choices for Leadville. Yes, that there were. I mean, not only like Keegan going with the big 42 chainring on the front or Lachlan and his contraption of a bike <laughs> all the way to hardtail mountain bikes with drop bars on them. Yep. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was just a very interesting choice of equipment out there. Well, so since we've been talking Keegan, maybe we should kind of go through his setup a little bit. Yeah, that, yeah, was, yeah. that was pretty unique. Back. There's His was maybe one of the more, I would say, subtle yeah, I was going to say, choices, right? you look at it from a distance, it doesn't look that out of the ordinary, but you get totally. up close and you can really see some yeah. unique pieces on there. So Santa Cruz Rider, he, of course, then was on the Highball CC frame, which is their, their hardtail cross-country race frame, um, running a SRAM transmission. He's a SRAM athlete, that makes mm-hmm. sense. The Highball is UDH compatible, so no problemo there. But a trend that we've been seeing in gravel, uh, we saw it at Unbound, we've seen it in quite a few races now, um, is really oversized chain rings. I think for guys competing at this level, the super wide range rear end, that 520% eagle Mm -hmm. uh, range that SRAM is offering, these guys don't need that low of gears. And so they're actually tossing on oversized chain rings um, to it seems like mostly to reduce mechanical drag. Mm-hmm. It's one of the main arguments for it. Um, so he ran a 40 tooth chain ring on the front, which if you're not a mountain biker is massive for trail bikes. That bike is only spec to clear a 38. So, so you're <laughs> pushing the limits as it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting choice. Which means his mechanic had to have worked. Yeah. As he said, a little bit of magic in order to get it to fit. Probably some, probably don't try this at home kind of magic. Yeah. Uh, some crazy spacers, maybe. But uh, I do want to know how he did it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just get a file out, <laughs> shave away some carbon. Yeah, it's probably a, a warranty voiding setup, yeah. I would imagine. Potentially. Yeah. There's been a lot of talks around this office of how you get bigger chain rings on <laughs> country mountain bikes. It, yeah. No one's figured it out here yet. That's the one thing that stops me from riding a hardtail mountain bike at gravel races is the chain ring capacity yep you want that bigger ring Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely he also ran the rock shock sid as the ultimate and that's the newer fork right it's only a couple weeks old now as far as being released yeah very light not the lightest fork on the market but right up there the the new one is now the lightest fork on the market is it It, as far as like an actual suspension fork not a a lauf Things. Right, right. That doesn't count. But, yeah, no, the new a, one. A dampened, fully adjustable. Because he, he, he was running the 120 SL, so not the like mm. 120 version, which is a little bit heavier, but the 100 mil version is extremely light. That's, yeah, sure. So super light front end. And I think this is probably the most interesting choice. Um, kind of a unique, you know, again, pressure on the mechanic to get things done. Santa Cruz um, is owned by the same company that owns Reserve Wheels. So you'll see Reserve Wheels now on Cervelo's, on Santa Cruz's. So of course he's riding Reserve Carbon Wheels. He chose to ride the gravel rim that Reserve makes as opposed to one of their mountain rims. Mm-hmm. The, the GR25, is it? It, mm-hmm. it is, yes. Mm-hmm. He said in one of his Instagram posts that it is more compliant. And because he's not running super wide tires, he didn't necessarily mm-hmm. need the wide rims. So that and on that kind of a course, that wheel just was going to be faster. Yeah, and you gotta think, right. I mean, we've heard the marketing spiel now from so many brands for years at this point that smoother is faster, more comfortable is faster. Mm-hmm. And if you, if you think of the context of a hundred mile off-road race, that is fatiguing to have something that beats you up a little bit more. If you can save a little bit of energy by having something a bit more comfortable, that could be, totally be a worth little it. bit lighter too then. I would assume so, because it um, looks like a narrower rim as well, which you just have to assume is a lighter rim. Mm-hmm. 
You have to go look up the specs, I suppose. And that doesn't just work, right? You can't just take the gravel rims and throw them on right. a <laughs> highball CC with a rock shock sit. They had to get relaced to mountain bike spaced boost um, hubs. Mm -hmm. So again, very like, it's Bravo. the fun thing with watching this yeah. stuff is you have to put some work in it. It's not just like stock off the shelf. Mm -hmm. um, Ran himself those Ma Maxis Aspen STs in a 2.25, which by modern standards is pretty pretty narrow. Yeah, they look more yeah. like gravel tires. And like yeah. the tread pattern too is a very smooth center tread with some yeah. knobbies on the Extremely end. Extremely fast rolling. Mm -hmm. Super fast rolling, yeah. And then uh, Santa Cruz's flat bar for a handlebar uh, up front, he ran a 660 mil. Um, again, context for some people, if you're not familiar with mountain stuff, trail bikes, it's like 780, 800 is like a really common width. So 660 is definitely on the narrow side. It's a little, I'd almost mm. say old school. Yeah. I mean, even back in 2015, when I was riding XC, I was running like 720s. Right. Which mm. I felt were pretty like narrow, <laughs> right. especially by today's standards. Right. So, and you got to consider, yeah, extremely short. Argument there is, you know, Leadville, it's not all just technical single track, right? You've got mm -hmm. sections of the course like power line and other things where you're just pedaling. Aerodynamics is a huge factor, especially the pace that Keegan will be pedaling yeah. at, right? So, And if you actually saw the bike setup, him, but not only him, also had bar tape wrapped around the inside close to the stem. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming so they could get down in that aero position, aero position for yeah. the wide open sections. That makes sense. That makes sense. Interesting thing, he ran the Garmin Edge 130. Mm -hmm. Weight was, savings? That's my guess. It's also, I mean, what good is Data going to do then? I mean, he just needs the timer, right? Like, he had his pacing plan. Yeah. All he needed was his timer and maybe power. The like, course is incredibly well marked. He's not yeah. needed for navigation. Right, yeah. Yeah, it very well could be. I, I just I want wonder less in the way. Do you think he is even looking at power at that point? Or is he just looking at, I have to be here by this time. And I'm going to sacrifice everything what it takes this to time to hit the, the course record. Could be. Yeah. He's, I, I imagine a guy like him is probably pretty in tune with his pacing right. and his body to just... He'll probably tell you what he's doing right now. Like exactly. He need exactly. Computer to tell him. Like he's got a power meter so they can look at the data after. He might not need it during like yeah. us mortals. That's interesting. Yeah. Also, potentially a weight savings thing. I don't know. I mean, yeah. that's that's marginal, but there's a lot of climbing at Leadville. I mean, there's some yeah. massive Garmin computers now, so <laughs> weight savings yeah. could be somewhat significant. You got like, a Garmin the size of your iPhone yeah. sitting on the front of your bike. The 130 just, is you know, small compared to most of them. So, and you know, we're used to talking road stuff. We've got a UCI weight limit at, at road events. There's no weight oh, limits yeah. on the bikes at these events. So mm -hmm. the lighter you go, there's no one's going to cut you off for making your bike too light. Mm -hmm. Uh, another interesting thing, we saw a few riders doing this. Uh, Keegan was one of the people that also ran road pedals instead of mountain. Yeah, and he has done it at quite a few other gravel events as well. Yeah. It's that thing of the road pedals provide a little bit more of a platform. Yep. Your feet aren't going to wrap around the pedal because it is just a bigger pedal. Yep. Slightly lighter and just a very secure fit. Like you're not planning on walking in an event like this right especially if you're at the front end of the race yep. so if you don't have to get off what does it matter what's on your feet absolutely yeah that, that is rotational mass you know you can't you can't refute mm -hmm. that you know if you want to say you saved weight with a garment that's kind of silly saving weight on your foot yeah. it matters that you're lifting that every single pedal stroke i mean if he's doing 100 rpms he's lifting that thing 100 times per minute uh, that's a lot yeah so that, that stuff all adds up yeah and if you know the course isn't going to require you to get off, that's really the big advantage of mountain shoes is you got to get off sometimes. Right. Um, yeah. Well, uh, we also had an interesting setup from Lachlan Morton. Jeff alluded to that. <laughs> Jeff, what, what was Lachlan's setup? The most standout thing on it is hands down the stem. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it um, wasn't that weird yeah. than that. Yeah, he, he took this, like, stem that's typically, like, a riser stem where you can raise your bars, like... 65 degrees or something like that and just flip that thing down i mean yeah. his handlebars were at the top of his fork crown yep yeah i like that jack pointed out though you looked at the bike by itself and it looked absolutely weird and bizarre like what is he thinking then you see a picture of him on the bike and it looks totally normal yeah like whatever body proportions he has he's he a just, lanky dude he's yeah. just a lanky guy it's just what he needed to get his fit so 
I, I guess that goes to say, you know, don't just do what looks cool. Sometimes you got to do what works. And yeah. for Lachlan, I mean, he got a decent result there. Yeah. Um, and that bike, it may look ridiculous, but he looked really normal and comfortable on it. So. Yeah, I think my favorite thing I saw from Lachlan post race was you know this Instagram story of a screenshot from one of the downhill segments of the course. Fourth overall on it. He's like, enough talk about this then. It descends fine. <laughs> like, Bravo. Good on it. Good on it. Top him. four finish on the Which downhills. All, I think you, all you need. Like pretty pretty incredible coming from a dude with a big road background too. Yeah. Like they aren't necessarily known for their descending skills, at least yeah, off road. And Lachlan, yeah. even these days, he's kind of just known for going and doing really, really long, stupid yeah. long events, like multi-day bike packing. He's kind of gotten into being a competitive bike packer. He did that all mm -hmm. tour last year or during the tour, he rode kind of the whole course self-supported and it transfers and notorious like for, uh, for doing that tour, the pictures of him doing <laughs> yes. it in Birkenstocks. Like he's just an interesting guy, but yeah, fourth at Leadville. Yeah. I think if it's a hard day, he's in for it. Right. We, I mean, we saw it unbound, right? He made mm -hmm. it into that break and he looked good good for it as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. There wasn't yeah. too much else crazy uh, bizarre on his bike. His saddle's like completely slammed forward, which looks mm -hmm. kind of funky as well. Probably to help with um, that down. And then to, the lefty fork on the Cannondales doesn't help it look more normal, it just, but it, it just makes it look funky. more obscure. Mm -hmm. that, and then his chain ring. Like, he yeah. one-upped even yeah. Keegan. <laughs> what did he have? It was a 42? 42. 42. 42. Oh. Monster and chain ring. I saw somewhere that like Keegan even like quoted Lachlan of like, it's not dumb unless you have to get off and walk or something like that. <laughs> like, as long as you can turn it over. Uh, it's reasonable. Probably not, not, not for me, maybe <laughs> not for the average uh, us mere mortals, but for those guys, it seems yeah. to be working. Do you think uh, like whenever they choose that, it's like a thing of, well, that means I can't go slow. Like you have to go a certain speed. There's absolutely a psychology to it yeah. of, you know, talking yourself it, into There it. were some steep sections on those climbs. Oh, yeah. Because oh, think yeah. about it, you're, going, you're climbing up a hill, and you're just reaching for a few easier gears yeah. as you go up. They don't exist. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, even if you don't want to, you, you're going to reach that easier one, and oh, I'll just, my mm -hmm. cams pick up, I'll go the same speed. Yeah. You don't have that option now. It and forces you into it. I mean, yeah. uh, one, of our, one of our good buddies that we've raced with for years, one of the first times they ran the Lost and Found gravel race, he did Lost and Found on a cyclocross bike. We didn't really have gravel bikes when it first kicked off. And what he had was a, he had a road group hanging out that he slid over to the cross bike. <laughs> so he did lost and found on a standard full size 5339 double with a standard 1128 in the rear. And he got third. <laughs> and I have to say half the reason he got third is because we got to the climbs and I got to shift down and he couldn't. So he just left me behind because that's what the gears were. There is absolutely something to be mm -hmm. said for like, if you don't have a choice, I guess you're going to pedal it. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of the idea of like single speed competing right. and stuff, yeah. right? Like you just, you can do it. <laughs> you just, just, you don't get a choice. So yeah. definitely interesting. Was last, it, uh, last or, bike. I'll touch on oh, okay. one more. 21.6 pounds for the total weight of it. With a suspension bike. fork and mountain bike tires. That's. Did that's he have a dropper on his too? I don't, oh, I don't remember. Because there was a few people that so. were running droppers. A lot of people were hard posting this one. Yeah, it's but, a big weight savings there. Yeah. But that's impressive. 21.6 pounds. Yeah. Light bike for sure. I don't know. That's full suspension bikes nowadays. So <laughs> Something like the Epic yeah, World Cup. And yeah. stuff. It's true. It's true. But they don't have piggly adjustable stems on the front. <laughs> <laughs> they they ultra light carbon stems or ultra alloy stems. Well, the last uh, really stand up bike that we couldn't help but comment on was uh, what Dylan Johnson chose to use. I think kind of we were talking about um, Keegan running narrow handlebars. There's, you know, aerodynamic advantage, maybe get in TT mode. Jack, what did Dylan do? He put drop bars on a cross-country mountain bike. That he did. That he did. And um, one thing I, I observed and thought about is um, Dylan's riding SRAM Axis and that Axis wireless shifting ecosystem, it all mm -hmm. talks to each other. So you can pair up road shifters with mountain derailers, mountain shifters with road derailers, it all works together, you know, as far as communicating and, mm -hmm. and cable stuff, you had to have, you know, make sure like, does this pull enough cable to move this derailleur correctly? Um, the wireless access stuff just eliminates that. So it, it makes it neat. Awesome. We're entering an era where there can be like a lot of cool experimentation. Dylan's riding a cross country hardtail mountain bike, suspension fork, and put drop handlebars on it. That's yeah, it's awesome. Super cool. 
It's cool to see. So, Jack, what was his setup? So you had the Fox 100mm uh, fork on the front, 2.2-inch uh, wide Conti Race Kings, 36-tooth um, chainring on there, so nothing too crazy. He probably followed the manufacturer's maximum guidelines and didn't yeah, put anything yeah, yeah, bigger yeah, on. within the lines. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, they had the SRAM Force axis shifters on there on the drop handlebars, 400mm um, wide bars, 70 mil stem, um, and his bike came out to 22 pounds as well, so... Right. Just some pretty crazy pretty like he was running there. a dropper post too okay that's like pretty good like that is for with a dropper. yeah absolutely and again that's where the shram really stands out is the mm -hmm. the drop bar shifters can match up to even even a dropper post he didn't the have the axis dropper post though no, he was running a fox one with a lever on the drop bar Mm, I wonder if yeah. the total system weight was lighter compared to like the battery on the axis post. With how analytical he is, I would say it probably is. Probably I also the wonder thing. there if it's a sponsorship thing. Mm, Fox, he's got a Fox deal. Could be in, yeah, I don't know. So I wonder where that line is drawn is of suspension. Right, of your, obviously, right. Obviously, your shock mm -hmm. is a full suspension and fork. Well, um, he's, he's riding for factor, so I often wonder like a guy like Dylan he may not have a mm -hmm. drivetrain sponsor at right. all, and he's just more running the mm -hmm. equipment that comes on the bikes, but he may have a Fox and or a yeah. SRAM sponsorship that has, you know, certain limitations. Also, some of these guys are willing to, like, forget the sponsorship. This is the equipment I think I need to win this right. event, which is kind of fun to see, too, you know, not just like, oh, this stuff's the best. Like, what do we see Alex Howes I'm that... Uh, <laughs> he can backfire, too. He can backfire. Yeah, Alex Howes that Unbound... Is that unbound? Complaining about the muck off sealant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and it's not directly a sponsor, but it's uh what do we call it? I think somebody called it uh, reverse influencing or uninfluencing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting era we're in where you don't just have to talk all highly about everything. Which I think thing. it was probably just a t bad tire decision. Probably. But probably. Uh, take take whatever he says. Muck off sealant, <laughs> tire decision, you know, whatever. An interesting thing with Dylan's setup, too, is I think him and a lot of the other guys were running tire inserts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He did have those Tubolito, I believe Tubolito, right? Yeah. The Tubolito tire inserts in there. Yeah. And I think Keegan had some inserts as well. I think most of those top guys are running tire inserts now to help reduce that potential for pinch flat. Mm. Because there's so many issues we saw on the coverage that uh, Russell Finsterwald flatted at one point, was able mm -hmm. to air it back up, but that's time time lost. That's like he got dropped lost. from the lead group and yep. had to chase back on for a long time. That's what Lachlan was saying too. He flatted pretty early on. Okay. Um, chased quickly to get back on. Remember in his interview, he was saying he had to make a decision of chasing on now to give himself a chance for the win to like get back into lead group, or work back slowly to have like probably a better day overall. He mm -hmm. kind of said, fuck it, I'm going to give it all the beans <laughs> right now to put myself for a chance to go for the win in this yeah. race. But all because of a flat, though, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, it's always better to not flat than to be able to fix a flat quickly, right. right? And the debate, I think, I mean, one of the first brands to launch inserts was Kushcore. And I remember when Kushcore first came out, people were like, rotational mass, that's like everybody's least favorite thing in the world. This is a weight that actually really matters. Mm -hmm. It's not just overall weight, it's it's rotational mm -hmm. mass. You feel that stuff. It's gonna change how the tire feels and how it acts. And we're seeing an adoption, I think, especially in, in, in the world of racing and gravel. Um, we're seeing it in some cross country stuff. We hear a little bit about it even at like road in the world tour, like EF using Vittoria's, allegedly mm -hmm. using their tire insert, X almost as a run flat. Um, with the tubeless, yeah. With the tubeless. And it's you are adding weight, but if you're dramatically reducing risk of flats, I mean, we say it all the time. Yeah. I'd rather spend five extra watts all day long and not be sitting on the side of the road. I think there's also the potential of offsetting the weight because you don't have to run as burly of a sidewall on your tire. It's mm -hmm. a good argument, too. So you could get very similar to, like, a heavier-duty tire with a light tire and an insert. Yep, yep. That yeah. is valid, yeah. And I think that was an argument Kushkor was making too. It's like the people are running much lighter weight casing tires mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. our tire liner. It's almost the equivalent in weight to a heavy duty tire, which you're gonna get really good ride feel. Um, you know, you probably get more cuts, but the cuts aren't gonna cause you, they aren't gonna end your day. Mm -hmm. So from a racing standpoint, yeah. I think for the average rider, 
inserts are probably a, a smart call because no, nobody likes fixing flats. Um, nobody wants fixed flats. Some of us are bad at fixing flats, you know. Uh, Dynaplugs are great. We love Dynaplug, but I'd rather not have to pull over and use a yeah. Dynaplug. Yeah. I mean, we talked about um, uh, Vanderpool's crash and it costing him about 12 seconds. He didn't have a flat. Imagine if he had. Yeah. He wouldn't have won. He wouldn't have won. No, like, yeah. that amount no of time way. is there between winning and losing or being there and not mm -hmm. being there. So, I think, I think inserts, there's well, a win for inserts, right? In, yeah. And inserts only work if you're running tubeless. Mm -hmm. So, another win for tubeless, too. Just another plug for tubeless. Gotta Absolutely. keep that tubeless plug on. Come see us at Mammoth. We'll talk to you. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll convert you to tubeless to this road. Boom. Yeah, definitely, definitely cool stuff there. Yeah, I wanted to touch on the the coverage from Leadville. Just the, I only watched the, or I first watched the highlights, but all from the helicopter shot, which mm -hmm. was, I don't think they had last year. I, I do remember. not think they had helicopter coverage last year. That was year. amazing. Yeah, you got great. Like, different parts of the entire race, you know, the helicopter's up the whole time. Mm -hmm. And just the footage you got, the actual, you know, the watch the race play out in the more remote sections was probably never been done before. Mm -hmm. It was really impressive to me. And it's, hopefully we'll make the other races in the series sort of step up and improve their coverage and yeah. see that across all the races in the U.S. And you, we are slowly seeing a transition in the U.S. for racing as far as having more coverage. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the NCL crit series, yeah. they're now on GCN+. Plus. So mm -hmm. you can go on there and watch them live even, yeah, which is pretty incredible. I think <laughs> all the promoters are just realizing like that's how things have to start going. Yeah. It makes it more approachable. I mean, like coming up and racing, like you, it's all trial by fire. You got to be confident enough and willing to go to these events. You got to find out when and where the events happen. And that in itself is not easy. Mm -hmm. You get some live video coverage and people can watch it and start to understand what's going on. I, I mean, I'm hopeful that it kind of opens the door to more people getting into racing in the U.S. I think it makes it more functional as far as, like, having professional cyclists in the U.S. now, too, sure. mm -hmm. right? Because if you are having coverage, like, if people can get on and watch you, you're going to be getting more sponsors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People are going to be putting more money into it just because yeah. of the exposure that comes with it. 100%. So I think it is going to be really good for American cycling in the long run. Well, then, yeah. good job to Lifetime Grand Prix and mm -hmm. the coverage was awesome of yeah. Leadville. We love seeing it. Really More impressive. of that. Every other promoter, take notes. If you can if you can pull off that kind of thing, do it. We're, we're loving it. Yeah. Agreed. And I think that sort of wraps up our episode. If you have any questions that you would like to see us answer on the next episode, go ahead and leave them down in the comments, and we'll go ahead and answer those next week. And I think we can go ahead and sign off. Okay. The burritos were good, the beers were good, and we talked a lot about bikes. Yeah, cheers, so, boys. Until next time. Podcast. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Yep, tune back in for episode three.